Hello, my name is Rob Corliss, and this talk is a recording of one that I gave at Lalo 60. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm even wearing the Lalo 60 uh, official t-shirt. So there, the t-shirt was courtesy of uh, Azar Shakuri, who made a few for some of the participants. Uh, the title of my talk is <clears throat> Hermit Interpolational Bohemians, an ongoing project with Lalo. Before I do that, I'll announce Maple Transactions, which is a, an open access journal with no page charges. Apparently this is called Diamond Class. Uh, we welcome expositions on topics, uh, topics of interest to the Maple community, including in computer-aided research in mathematics, in education and applications. Student papers are especially welcome. Another announcement. Uh, we just published a new book, Computational Discovery on Jupiter, uh, by uh, Neil Kalkin, Eunice Chan, and myself. <laughs> this was published in November. There is an open access version of this online. Just Google Computational Discovery on Jupiter, and you'll see it. It, the relevance for this talk is that this has a chapter on bohemian matrices and I'm going to be talking about bohemian matrices. So a family of matrices is called bohemian <coughs> if all entries are all from a single finite population which we'll call P. The name comes from bounded height matrix of integers uh, and see bohemianmatrices.com for instances. Some of those were generated by students. See also the November 2020 London Math Society newsletter where we made the cover. Such matrices have been studied for quite a long time, for example, by Olga Towski Todd, although the name Bohemian only dates to 2015. See also the Wikipedia entry. Here's a partial list of some related work. Uh, with Lalo. The most recent on this list is the Linear Algebra and Applications paper, Upper Hessenberg and Tuplitz Bohemians. Uh, that represented a substantial body of, of work and we actually made some interesting progress on that. And I recommend that you have a look at that paper. An older paper also in LAA is uh, <coughs> on the Bazoo matrix for Hermit interpolates. So there no bohemian stuff, but the Hermit interpolation is there. <clears throat> a couple of previous papers in the journal Computer Aided Geometric Design are relevant to this idea of uh, representing a polynomial in a, not in the standard monomial basis, but using instead its values. Uh, our paper with John Butcher attacked a more general problem, Birkhoff interpolation, and this is uh, useful for numerical solution of differential equations. Before that, we had work on barycentric Hermite interpolants for event location in initial value problems for ordinary differential equations. And going way back to uh, 2004, uh, I gave an, an invited talk at I IACA 2004 in Santander, uh, which uh, Lalo had organized, and the talk was on polynomial algebra by values. And this paper was never published on its own, but it's up on the uh, ORCA Technical Report website. So here's a <coughs> screenshot of uh, the Janayan paper of the barycentric Hermite interpolates for event location. And I've also snippeted out uh, a reference there, the, the reference 24. Uh, positions and companion matrix pencils for barycentric Hermite interpolants to be submitted. Well, <laughs> we never did. Uh, the, two, the 2015 LAA paper replaced part of it, but there's still a whole bunch of stuff on uh, barycentric Hermite interpolants that we haven't uh, uh, actually written down. So here's a, a photographic proof that uh, <laughs> we were working together. This is the from the uh, uh, Iaka Banquet in Somo, across the bay from Satander. There's myself on the on your left, and Lalo in the middle, and the late Agnes Santo on your right. Okay, let's get started. Here's today's problem. 
here's an image. What is this image? This image is a density plot of all 9,961,472 zeros of all of a certain collection of polynomials. And how we define these polynomials is we said that at the nodes uh, minus one, minus one half, zero, one half, and one, we would specify that their values were plus or minus one, their derivatives were plus or minus one, their second derivatives were plus or minus one, and their third derivatives were plus or minus one on all of those nodes. And then I computed the zeros of all of those polynomials. And then I took a 1000 by 2000 pixel image and I counted the number of eigenvalues were in each pixel. And you can tell the scale because uh, uh, minus one and one are on the left and right ends of that uh, curious figure. There are some regularly distributed uh, zeros or eigenvalues outside that uh, lozenge, but we'll not pay too much attention to those. But instead, we're going to think about what's happening at the ends, where it looks like we've got these curious flower petals. Why do we have flower petals as an image of zeros or eigenvalues? This is just a surprise. Here, we zoom in on that, and we zoom in to the region uh, 0.75 less than the real part, less than 1.25, and minus 0.25, less than the imaginary part, less than 0.25. So we can see the petals more clearly, and I think they look weirder. So it looks like we have eight spikes around a dark circle. I don't know if my little hand will show up on this video, but I'm pointing at a spike just below the, the real axis, and we just count all the spikes all the way around, including this one, and we have eight. And they make an outline of a circle surrounding the point uh, one, when lambda, where lambda equals one. It is not possible for eigenvalues to, to uh, be too close to one because the value of the polynomial is either plus one there or minus one. So there is a disk which surrounds that point which where no roots of the polynomials will lie. That partially explains what's going on, but it doesn't explain why we have uh, lobe-shaped empty regions surrounding that circle and doesn't explain why we have spikes coming in. Uh, here I up the confluency instead of uh, just evaluating the derivatives or specifying the derivatives up to uh, the third derivative we specify the derivatives up to the fourth derivative at each node and so the grade of the polynomials we have five um, nodes and five, five pieces of information at each node. So that's 25 pieces of information. So that means the degree must at most be 24. The word grade there means that the degree at most. And we count 10 spikes. So with two pieces of data, we say, aha, with confluency four, we had eight spikes and confluency five, we have 10. Uh, there must be uh, two times the confluency number of spikes around there. So this is a this is not uh, computing all of the roots of the polynomials, but rather a sample of 500,000 polynomials. And uh, so that means 12 million roots. Now I've written their sample of 500,000 matrices, and so 12 million eigenvalues, and that's the method that I use to uh, compute the roots of these Fermi interpolational polynomials. Here we have confluency six and 12 spikes, okay, confirming our uh, intuition. But I find these curious fish hook, hook features very strange, and I have no explanation for those, those fish hook features. 500,000 matrices again, so 14 and a half million eigenvalues. Confluency seven, 14 spikes, yay. Uh, confluency 13, 26 spikes. Okay, we're seeing enough regularity to detect a pattern. We'd like to be able to prove that that's so. I will not give a proof today. I have an idea, but I don't have the proof written down yet. So here is uh, an image 
complete image where the nodes are confluency 12 at each non-zero node and 13 at the zero node, just so the grade of all of the polynomials is 60. Happy birthday, Lalo. So again, we're plotted on minus 1.25 less, uh, less than the real part less than 1.25 and minus 0.625 less than or equal to the imaginary part less than, less than or equal 0.625. And most of the features of this plot are unexplained. But I have some ideas. I want to talk to you about how I computed those zeros, though. And I'm going to use an example matrix, which is much simpler. Uh, Hermite interpolational problem. So let's just slam this matrix down. We see in the top row minus f over 2, minus e, minus d, minus c, minus b, and minus a, and a 0 in the top left corner. And then we see a bunch of strange numbers in the first column 1 16th, minus 5 64th, 17 256th, minus 1 16th, minus 1 16th, and minus 102, uh, 1 over 256. And then in the diagonals, we have three blocks. We have a block with just a three down in the, in the bottom right corner. And then we have a block with two fives and a one just beneath it and a zero above it. And then we have a block with three sevens and two ones just beneath it. So sort of like a Jordan block, but transposed. <clears throat> now I also need another matrix. I need another matrix, which I'll call C1, which is the same as the identity matrix except that just as in C0, the upper left entry is zeroed out. Then, if we take the determinant of Z times C1 minus C0, I claim that that's a polynomial of grade 5, which satisfies P of 3 equals A, P of 5 equals B, P prime of 5 equals B, so the two pieces of information at 5, P of 7 is D, P prime at 7, is e and p double prime of seven is equal to f. Now there's a on over two in here, so that there's that taking care of the factorial for the for the Taylor series. And so since that determinant is equal to the interpolating polynomial, the generalized eigenvalues of the matrix pencil therefore give the roots of uh, p of z equals zero. So I need to explain what those unnormalized number in the first column are. <clears throat> Here's how they're computed. They come from a partial fraction. We have one piece of information at z equals 3, so we've got a z minus 3 to the power 1. We have two pieces of information at z at 5, so we've got a z minus 5 squared. We have three pieces of information at, at z equals 7, so that's z minus 7 cubed. And I just do the partial fraction decomposition expansion of that. I get minus 1 and 256, minus 1 16th, minus 1 16th, 17 256 minus 5 64ths and 1 16th, and those are the numbers that occurred in that first column. Just read them off. And I've talked about the block diagonal structure as well. So if I give you a Hermit interpolational problem, just telling you where the information is and what the, what the information is, you can write down a pair of matrices whose generalized eigenvalues are the zeros of the interpolating polynomial that fits that data. Here's the general case. Um, some people learn by specific examples. Others like the general case first. So uh, I'm doing the general case second. The node polynomial is the product of x minus xi. If each xi is the node or i equals 0 to m, so we have m plus 1 nodes, and each one of those has confluency s sub i. That's an integer bigger than or equal to 1. If the integer was 0, then the node wouldn't appear, so we, there's no point in having allowing zeros in there. We compute the generalized barycentric weights by computing the partial fraction decomposition of this 1 over this node polynomial, and that's a straightforward exercise from first-year calculus. So we just consider that that has been done. <clears throat> then the barycentric forms of the interpolating polynomials can be written in the following two ways. The first line, equation 5, is the first barycentric form. It's the node polynomial times this rational function, which has got uh, pole of, poles of various strength at each node. But those poles will get cancelled out by the node polynomial, so this is in fact a, a polynomial. This thing down at the bottom doesn't look like a polynomial, but it is. Uh, if we just take W of Z, the node polynomial, and write it as 1 over 
its partial fraction expansion, we get a ratio of things with singularities, and it's called the second barycentric form. And it's also a lovely way to evaluate this uh, polynomial. Now, uh, one thing while I'm looking at this equation six, you notice that all the, B, the beta ij's occur on the top and on the bottom. So I can multiply those beta ij's by any scalar constant and you know, multiply the whole thing top and bottom by five or whatever. Uh, that will not change the evaluation of the polynomial. So that won't change the roots either. And I say, we, obviously, we can multiply all of the values, the rho i by another constant. We can multiply the, all of those by 10 or whatever we like. And that, wouldn't, that would change the values of p, but it would not change the roots. It wouldn't change the location of the zeros. So those two things, in, with those two things in mind, we look at the uh, uh, <coughs> code. We look at the code for these um, uh, companion, generalized uh, companion matrices. So MATLAB code to compute the generalized barycentric weights can be found at the code repository for my book with Nick Filion. And also you can find MATLAB code to evaluate the Hermite interpolational polynomial. The Maple code to do the same is called uh, BHIP for Barycentric Hermite Interpolation Polynomial, and that's in the workbook accompanying my uh, paper Barycentric Hermite Interpolation, which appeared in Maple Transactions uh, uh, this month. So I have the link here. Yeah, I might as well follow it. So this paper contains quite a bit more background information about barycentric Hermite interpolation, and you may wish to uh, uh, pursue it. And the support workbook is on the Maple Cloud. You can uh, look at it on the Maple Cloud or download it and, evaluate and, and use your own copy of Maple to uh, uh, investigate. That contains all of the code, the, the BHIP. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you can multiply the first row or the first column by any scalar we like. That's because multiplying the first row just changes the values of row by a scalar factor, and that doesn't alter the roots. And multiplying the first column just scales the barycentric weights by a common factor, and that doesn't even change the values. So it certainly won't change the root. So it turns out that the matrices will be more easily balanced if we scale the first column, so there's norm one, and the first row, that, so that it has nine, uh, norm one. And this does help the accuracy of the eigenvalues for larger dimensions. The eigenvalue problem does get difficult, difficult to solve numerically as the confluency increases, because some of the generalized barycentric weights grow combinatorially. Having weights of greatly different sizes makes the eigenvalue problem difficult, but I claim it's better conditioned than expanding it all out into the monomial basis is. And that poor conditioning of the expanded out polynomial slows down f solves. So these eigenvalue techniques, even though they're wasteful, are faster than f solve, even though f solve has been sped up in the last version of Maple. <clears throat> so here's a curiosity that I just thought about uh, when preparing these slides, uh, if I, because the determinant is linear in the first row, we can find a whole bunch of matrices whose determinant are exactly the elements of the Hermite interpolational basis. So here, for example, is one where uh, the I've replaced the C with a one and everything else with a zero. So the determinant of that is the coefficient of C in the in the Hermite interpolated her, Hermite interpolational polynomial, and so that is a polynomial which is zero when z equals five, but has derivative one when z equals five, and is zero at all the other spots where data is given. Now we actually have an explicit expression for this determinant, but I just thought that was kind of neat. Back to that Bohemian problem that we're actually looking at here. So <clears throat> the grade of the, pol the first polynomial was 19, which is one less than 20. The companion pencil is 21 by 21. 
So two of its eigenvalues will spuriously be infinity. So every eigenvalue, every root of the polynomial is an eigenvalue of the problem, but we have two spurious eigenvalues at infinity. We just throw those away. Uh, for our problem, each of those 20 pieces of information can be one or minus one, and that's all. This is a Bernoulli problem, which is analogous to the Littlewood polynomials, which in the monomial basis, their coefficients are either plus or minus one. So here we have two to the 20th subsets of numbers. We take advantage of one symmetry. If P of Z is in this collection, so it's minus P of Z, so we can fix one of those values. For example, P of minus one is one. And this means there's only two to the 19, which is 524,288 such matrices. So at most, two to the 19 times 19 equals 9,961,472 eigenvalues, which are roots. Took my code about 14 minutes to compute all of these eigenvalues. And that was three times as fast, at least three times as fast as computing the zeros of the degree 19 polynomials, which I also computed just to compare. And as I said, even though Maple's F solve has been greatly improved. And the problem is once you expand those polynomials, uh, they have rational coefficients and you see those rational coefficients are actually really quite large. And the resulting polynomial, polynomials in the monomial basis are poorly conditioned. And F solve works very hard to get the roots right, and it internally bumps up precision in order to do that. So here's a discussion of some of the inefficiencies of the matrix approach. Each matrix has two spurious infinite eigenvalues. So that's about 10%. Solving a generalized eigenvalue problem with two matrices is about five times as expensive as solving a simple eigenvalue problem of the same dimension. A uh, factor of five, we're getting up there. So solving eigenvalue problems costs order m cubed flops. Flop is a floating point operation. But solving polynomial problems ought to cost only order m squared. Specialized al algorithms exist for many matrices of analogous structure, quasi-separable matrices, that are order of m squared in cost and reasonably stable. So see the work by Leonardo Robel, Jared Orens, and David Watkins, and others. But none of those algorithms work for the structure of matrices that I have here. And that last um, <coughs> factor, factor of m, is particularly important. So in size m equals 20, these experiments could go 20 times faster or maybe 100 times faster if we get, get a, a simple eigenvalue problem in there. And so instead of 20 minutes, one minute for the dimensions used to this talk. But some efficiencies, still way faster than f solve. Uh, it turns out then the reason for that is I'm not changing the basis. I'm working in the given Hermite interpolational basis so that all of these computations are as numerically stable as possible and I can use ordinary double precision arithmetic. The problems are in fact well conditioned in this basis if the confluency is not too large. I mean, five or six or 10 or 12 is not too large. Getting, getting up there with, with 12 or 13. Neither I nor anyone I know had to write any specialized solvers. I just used linear algebra eigenvalues right off the shelf. I threw away the first two eigenvalues, which were always the infinite ones. The problem is trivially parallel. All I need to do is to make the task model work in Maple or switch to Julia or something. But Maple can now automatically do some things in parallel, which I found really impressive. So here is a uh, an instrumented uh, getting 500,000 eigenvalues, uh, eigenvalues of 500,000 matrices and the real time was 66 minutes but it's the cpu time was four and a half hours and that's on a four core eight thread surface pro just just a little this is my demonstration my my giving my talks computer and i did nothing to direct the parallelism maple just did that by itself so kudos for for doing that all right i'm going to wind up now, this particular Bohemian problem has a, a puzzle for us. Why flower petals? And that's not yet understood, although I have an idea. 
Uh, I hope, though, that you can see that one can solve Hermit interpolational polynomials easily. Just find the roots uh, without changing the polynomial basis. Experimental mathematics, such as this exploration of the Bohemian problem, can use these tools. And the other thing is, Bohemian matrices make good test problems, which is my original uh, motivation for, for doing them. So, thank you for listening, and happy birthday to Lalo. This work was partially supported by uh, my NSERC grant, partially supported by a project in Spain for the Spanish MICNN. The conference, I've been calling it Lalo 60, its official name is Matrices and Polynomials in Computer Algebra, Algorithms, and Software, has been generously supported by the Fields Institute for Mathematical Research, Gunef University, Orca, Cargo at Wilfrid Laurier University, MapleSoft, and the Computer Science Department at Western University. And also by all of the participants who came and gave such lovely talks.